Hello everyone, I'm Terry Duke and this is part 2 of The Walking Dead in Real Life, where I look at how the zombie virus from The Walking Dead show and comics would play out in real life. The whole point of this fun experiment, really, is to see if we arrive at the same conclusion as The Walking Dead comics and show, a world completely destroyed by walkers. So the parameters had to be set just right, and in part 1, I came to the conclusion that for the virus to be as destructive as it is portrayed, it had to be of extraterrestrial origins. This allows it not only to be too advanced for humanity to even understand, but also to infect the world very quickly. Check out part 1 if you want to see the whole reasoning behind that, but for part 2, this is all about how it plays out, so let's do this. But first... <clears throat> Alright, look. Obviously, the Walking Dead virus is not real. But I would argue that even if it was real, having good dental hygiene is essential for biting and chewing and overall the conception of flesh. And what better way to remind yourself to brush your teeth than with the dental notebook? Look at this thing. It's a book to write notes in. And it's got this big tooth on the cover. It's a dental notebook. How amazing is that? Okay, uh, in all honesty, <laughs> this isn't a sponsorship of any kind, but my girlfriend happens to work in a dental clinic and she figured out that you can make notebooks online and put them up for sale on Amazon. So, you know, if you ever need a notebook, well, you can follow the link down below to get yourself one of these babies. You won't be directly supporting the channel if you do, but it will make my girlfriend money and she can use that money to buy me nice things, so that's close enough. Now back to the video. First week. Reports of minor accidents. The zombie virus, in the form of a space spore, lands on planet Earth. And within 48 hours, most of the world is infected. However, for those first two days, no one can tell, as the virus has no symptoms for the living. But eventually, people die. Fun fact, according to the World Death Clock, that's a real thing, around 56 million people die each year. That's an average of over 150,000 people per day. So on day 3 especially, we're going to start witnessing the first people reanimating. Given that most people tend to die in hospitals or nursing homes, we can safely assume that most people to be bitten first will either be first responders, hospital staff, or loved ones. Mind you though, these first 150,000 walkers are spread out all over the planet. Given the completely spread out nature of these incidents and complete unawareness of the far bigger threat that just begun, we can expect these incidents to largely stay quiet on the first week. Hospital staff won't be putting down no walkers, they will be trying to restrain them. That's because zombies aren't considered zombies yet, but rather patients going through some unexplained psychosis episode of some kind. This unwillingness to kill will result in a lot more bites. By the end of the first week, most hospital staffers that were bitten are taking sick days, staying at home, where they quickly fall to the fever. Second week. Memes and confusion. By the second week, reports of cannibalism are coming in fast. Paramedics responding to car crashes are getting assaulted. Hospitals have had violent attacks. The UN and World Health Organization are having meetings, conducting investigations. There seems to be a disease spreading, but given how quickly reports are coming in from everywhere at once, and no apparent connections between any of the infected can be found, no one knows what's going on. Simultaneously, social media is on fire. People are taking videos on their phones of really weird stuff happening. People on TikTok are joking that zombies are roaming around. Now, I'm no mathematical genius or anything, so keep that in mind as my math could be way off. But if we have 150,000 people dying of regular causes per day, that's 150,000 new walkers every day. Now, let's assume one walker in three manages to bite and kill someone. A third of 150,000 is 50,000, that's 50,000 more people that will die from the bite and reanimate the following day, giving us a total of 200,000 new walkers per day. So 12 days after people started reanimating, we're looking at the barest minimum at roughly 2.3 million walkers worldwide. But that's assuming, of course, that only one in three walkers bites only one person on their first day and no more. If bite rates were any higher though, we could easily have over 10 million walkers globally by the end of the second week. Third week. Pandemic, or apocalypse, declared. By now, the evidence of a pandemic becomes overwhelming, and so the World Health Organization, as well as most countries, declare that a new pandemic is underway. But wait, a pandemic? How do we stop it from spreading? Where is it even coming from? Can we spot the symptoms? The experts studying this disease have no idea yet just how surpassed they are. The disease is dormant and therefore cannot be detected in the living. And because of that, it's impossible to establish how it even spreads, or who has it. Is it airborne? Should people wear a mask? Socially distance? But much more importantly, 
Are walkers even alive? Many were declared dead initially, but now, while clearly violent and incoherent, they can still move, hear, and see, making the suggestion that this is a zombie plague and that governments should put those zombies down would be a very dangerous proposal. So for the time being, countries are basically responding to the crisis in their own confused ways. In China and North Korea, lockdowns are ordered and the military is deployed in infected areas to round up walkers and take them away. In other parts of the world, people are starting to preemptively handcuff dead people to their beds and locking the doors behind them. But as more and more walkers start appearing, certain areas become festering grounds. In underdeveloped countries especially, disorganized authorities can do little to address the situation, resulting in panic and more bites. Everywhere though, small outbreaks start to appear. Police are responding to calls of violent attacks in public hospitals, nursing homes, suburbs, as well as apartment buildings in the inner city, and crowded areas such as shopping malls and town centers are forced to close down. Mind you, we're still not talking about massive herds, walkers are still slow and people tend to flee the areas where some are spotted. However, by and large, these incidents are still widely spread throughout the world, no city is even close to falling, and rural areas especially have little to no exposure at all. For most people that have not yet witnessed walkers, there will be a lot of alarm on TV, but also very little explanation from the experts. So the internet will start doing what it does best, use non-existing expertise to spread misinformation. This is the wrath of God, religious people start arguing. We're being punished for the degeneracy of the gays. And WhatsApp users? They start blaming 5G towers. People from every country start blaming every other country, and especially minorities within their own communities. Throughout the massive confusion, the walkers rise in numbers every day, and no effective solution has yet to be offered. Fourth week. Killing the infected? By now, scientists would have been studying the walkers thoroughly for at least two weeks. And while they would still not be able to determine how they got the disease, let alone how to cure it, physiology would be well understood. Walkers appear to slowly decay, they only have minimal brain function, and don't appear to be affected by injuries or starvation. If we have anything as high-tech as Dr. Jenner in the show, then scientists would unanimously conclude that walkers are not in fact people. But try convincing the entire world of that, and try convincing people that the state executing sick people is necessary. You think people were upset that they had to wear masks? Oh boy. By the end of the first month, walkers globally would reach anywhere from 10 to 30 million in numbers, and the main consensus would be that they need to be restrained and contained, not executed. So how would that look? Well, depending on the area and resources available, we could be talking about repurposed prisons, quarantine zones, or fortified hospitals and morgues. Hoarding all of the walkers in the same place, though, is exactly what could turn this into a catastrophe. For if a large herd breaks out, then they would potentially be able to bulldoze through a city. But ultimately, it would be up to governments and possibly private citizens to decide whether or not walkers should be put down. One thing is sure, the number of bitten people each day could be reduced significantly by taking certain precautions. By now, the World Health Organization would start recommending that dying people be handcuffed to their beds or furniture, and even possibly putting something to cover their mouth to prevent reanimated people from biting anyone. Second month to second year, chaos. Let's do a quick recap. People started reanimating as zombies all over the globe, leading to tons of mass confusion and countries took lots of drastic actions with little effect to stop the spread of a disease that no one understands. By now though, experts would have agreed that walkers are indeed dead, and curing the dead is not possible. But with that information, governments still have limited options. Do they keep containing every walker they find, hoping a non-existent cure would be created, or should the walkers be put down? Naturally, police states would be the first ones to go with the latter. China, North Korea, Saudi Arabia will be among the first countries to use the military as death squads, sending out patrols into infected areas to purge them out of walkers. Countries will follow suit over time, but I can see this becoming a big problem in many parts of the world, especially the USA. You can bet a lot of people will be using their second amendment when the military shows up to put down their loved ones. Between countries trying to fight the walkers and possibly their own citizens, lockdowns and martial law will cause the economy to crash. Crimes and riots will skyrocket supplies will run low. There would also be a lot of misinformation regarding the treatment of bites. This is where I say that contrary to the comics and show, amputation of bitten limbs would not work. According to the Walking Dead Wikia, a bite infects people through the bloodstream, but blood travels through the body in about one minute, so if someone was bitten, it would be mere seconds before the virus makes its way past the limb. Even a tourniquet could not be applied in time to stop the circulation, so amputation to contain the virus would simply not work. But I digress. 
On the side of science, it's during this period of mass confusion and chaos that the more devastating discovery will be found. As reports of people reanimating are coming from virtually everywhere, the focus will shift from recording where the virus has spread to where he did not. Scientists will be looking for any, any recorded example of someone dying at any point and did not come back. And when they can't find such an instance, this is when it will be declared that everyone is infected, that everyone is coming back no matter what. And given how the virus is still misunderstood and can't even be detected properly, conspiracy theories during this period will get far worse. Governments will be blamed. Hate crimes against minorities will explode. Religious fanatics will make more religious fanatics. In many areas of the world, strict lockdowns and martial law are implemented. The military and police are now actively patrolling the streets, hunting down roaming walkers. And so for the year, expect a lot of carnage. Second year, aftermath. I can only speculate as to how many people would die in the first year, but assuming the same average of 56 million people dying of other causes, how many people would die from being bit by those 56 million walkers, and how many more would be bitten as a result of more walkers and so forth, this makes all of this virtually impossible to put a number on the actual death toll. But I would be surprised if it exceeded more than half a billion people. Not that losing 6.3% of the world population within a year would not have devastating consequences. Half a billion is still roughly 10 times the casualties of World War II, and that's just in one year instead of six. The severity and sheer violence of the virus itself will greatly affect the population's mental health. The addition of possible economic collapse, along with the financial uncertainty, food shortages, sudden lack of healthcare services, the lockdowns, the stripping of human rights, you can expect rates of depression and suicide to go way up during this period. When it comes to the walkers, their biggest advantage would have been their initial element of surprise, for sure. After that, it's people's initial hesitation to kill walkers because of a perceived humanity, and not knowing that to destroy walkers, you need to get the brain. But on the other hand, I would say that once those things are figured out, the world would respond fairly quickly. The biggest mistake would be to keep walkers alive, but as reanimation becomes expected, tying dead people up and covering their mouths would be very effective at rendering new walkers harmless. And of course, eventually they would just be shot in the head once the person is declared dead. Hell, I can even see the governments dispensing nail guns into hospitals for quick and clean walker preventions after a while. Beyond that, even in areas in which walkers become numerous, awareness of walkers only being put down by headshots would travel fairly quickly. And the walkers are still slow, loud, and easy to spot. Once the military makes up their mind about finding walkers, it's a battle they would win easily, assuming they keep their distance and that healthy civilians comply and don't get in the way. Bullets and other supplies would not be an issue in a world that is still largely intact. By the end of the second year, the most dangerous area would have been secured, and with the element of surprise completely gone, it's doubtful that the walking dead virus would ever be as deadly as it was in the first few months. The focus would shift from open fighting against herds of walkers, and instead, a lot of countries would create their own units of special police that have the sole purpose of responding to sightings of walkers. These units would wear more conventional armor to protect themselves from bites, and their weapons would be optimized for killing walkers without making a mess or a lot of noise. Third year. Endemic. And so by the third year, broadly speaking, the focus globally is now learning to live with this new disease. I doubt civilians will just be handed guns and other weapons to clear up their own neighborhoods, but as economies reopen and society starts rebuilding, new methods of protection could be distributed to the population. Instead of people walking around with masks, they might wear some form of protection, like simple vent braces, meant to offer a walker appearing out of nowhere something to chew on that isn't flesh, until you can run away or help arrives. But in conclusion, I feel confident in saying that the Walking Dead virus as depicted in the show is completely unrealistic. Even making the virus both incurable and capable of infecting the entire world instantly does not bring us even remotely close to the Walking Dead apocalypse. While the advanced nature of the virus means it can take the entire world by surprise, the walkers themselves are not as fast or dangerous enough as depicted in other movies to be a serious threat to humanity once it gets its act together. The one part from the comics, which would very much be true in real life as well, is the thematic itself. As Kirkman said, a good zombie movie shows us how messed up we are. Zombies, even in the simulation, don't have an agenda. They're essentially a force of nature, and they do not care whether you are good or evil, or rich or poor. 
but it is undeniable that many people would be doomed to suffer far more than others simply because our society is designed that way. And so the most destructive element would not be the walkers themselves, but how we respond to them. Our initial reaction to immediately distrust our neighbors and fend for ourselves, to blame other people and lose our sense of morality is definitely something that would happen on some level in real life. But as history has showed us time and time again, times of crisis, be it disease, famine or war, can also be times of revolutions, of change. And as a market socialist myself, while I would hope that something good would come out of a Walking Dead virus apocalypse, like better redistribution of wealth and workers taking control of their workplaces, I can't deny the dangerous risk that fascism could also arise. In a world plagued by the Walking Dead virus, social disorder could cause states to collapse and leave a power vacuum behind. These could be filled with fascists and theocrats, bringing humanity into a new dark age of sorts, where human rights regress considerably despite humanity being left fairly intact. This is all speculation, obviously, but it goes to show the real outcome of the simulation isn't about how bad the virus destroys the world, but about how bad we destroy ourselves as a result. Thanks for watching, everyone. I needed a break from my usual gaming content, and this was a fun project to work on, but I'll get back to my usual content now. But what do you think? Do you like my take, or am I way off? Let me know in the comments, and don't forget to subscribe while you're at it. Have a good one.